Any strange dreams or hallucinations? I dream of slitting the throats of little girls. Do you know any little girls? Oh my God, help me! Help! We have a problem at Godfrey Correctional Facility. I've never heard of it. Well, that's because it doesn't really exist as far as anyone outside of DOJ knows. We were working these issues. It seems that the team leader, Dr. Mobley, decided to blow his head off two days ago. NIH doesn't believe Mobley was suicidal. Just write an airtight report that puts this thing to rest. Agent Crenshaw, Dana Earhart, and Dr. Mobley's research assistant. Each inmate is brought here once a week for psychological tests and counseling. Is that your husband and little girl? Yeah. What happened? He hung himself. Hello? It's the evil in this place. It's taunting you. It's setting traps for you. Wait. <laughs> According to Mobley, the evil gene is a genetic marker, making the bearer more susceptible to demonic influences. You look like you've seen a ghost. Some of what you're experiencing isn't real, Griff. <laughs> what are you doing to me? Wesley! I'm trying to help you. You and everybody else like you. Let's go. It's time to end this. The only demons here are the ones that people bring with them. Hey everyone, I just want to thank our sponsor, HostGator. HostGator is bringing you film talk as it does every time. Every time we do a film talk, HostGator is there. They are a leading provider of shared, resold, VPS, and dedicated hosting solutions. They have award-winning support available 24-7, 365 days a year via phone, email, and live chat. Any which way you can think of. Maybe even Carrier Pigeon. Who knows? You can discover why over 9 million websites trust HostGator and use HostGator. And if you would like to sign up for a new hosting package, which you should, you can use the coupon code GAMEITALL and receive 25% off your first hosting plan. Hey everyone, it's another edition of Film Talk here on GameItAll.com. A very special guest here today, we got Richard Spate Jr. on the line. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And uh, Richard, I'm just going to get this out of the way right away because I know this is the role that most people will, uh, or a lot of people will know you from, and that is, of course, Brooks in Ernest Goes to Camp. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. That's the one I hang my hat on. People know me from that. That, <laughs> that is the one you will go down in history for. <laughs> uh, no, of course, um, as we were discussing just before this started, you're down doing uh, a convention for Supernatural down in Dallas right now. I am indeed. We just, in fact, uh, Rob Benedict and I just went on stage to introduce Jared and Jensen. So it's happening as we speak. That's awesome. And Rob Benedict on the show Supernatural, he plays the basically the author of the Supernatural books. Is that right? Yeah, he pretty much is God. But yeah, he, yeah, that's you know, right. That's right. You think he's the prophet, and then he ends up being God. A lot of people end up changing throughout the course of the show. <laughs> yeah, really, truly. But you know, if you're going to change. Being God is not a bad way to land. You know what I'm saying? Robbie did pretty good. <laughs> you can't really go much. You can't really go up much from there. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, okay. So right now you're also uh, promoting a little film uh, that I just saw. It was a really cool little psychological thriller called The Evil Gene. Correct. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about that movie then and your character kind of in the movie? Evil Gene is a, like you said, is a psychological thriller uh, that takes place in a prison that houses inmates that have been scientifically proven to contain uh, a genetic encoding that makes them evil. And so there's a story built around that in which, in which one of the doctors in the prison gets killed and they try to uh, track down who the killer is. But at the same time, it also deals with the moral issue of should we be testing to figure out if people are predisposed to be bad? Does being predisposed to be bad mean you definitely will act on it and be bad? And should the government intervene or have anything to do with that kind of testing and or housing with those kinds of inmates? It's a very interesting question posed by the film, which is what attracted me to it. I play Griff Crenshaw, who's the FBI agent, who's you know a bit of a mess himself, who's sent to the 
to this prison to investigate the murder, and what they want out of him is for him to write an, a report that supports the FBI's desires in terms of the program, but when he gets there, he finds out that it's not as black and white as people may think, as his boss's wishes he, he thought at least. So he's forced to sort of deal with the realities of what the program is and what the results and effects are. Yeah, and I um I just I just saw it and I just wanna to say too, it's got a nice like run time, it's really fast paced, doesn't linger at all, just kinda of shoots for the fences and <laughs> And now, uh, good, is, good. That available, I'm good. is that available on VOD right now? Yeah, it's on iTunes and uh, Amazon and some other outlets. It's all it's all around. It's all the places where you go get your your VOD. It's there. Awesome. And you also work now. You also worked with a first time, I believe, first if not first time director, then a first time feature director, uh, Catherine Taylor. So what, what yeah, was that like? Director, first time director. She was great. Like Catherine wrote the script. Um, I, I think it's her first produced screenplay. I believe she'd written before, but it's her first produced screenplay. She's a first-time director um, and very passionate about the project. It was her baby. It was her idea. It was a smart idea. She's a smart woman. Um, and I thought she did a very nice job telling the story. I mean, obviously, we were uh, operating on a very indie schedule and indie budget. Um, but within that framework, I thought she did a very nice job of crafting the story. That's awesome. Yeah, like I said, it's really cool that you got a first-time director, and uh, she hits it out of the park. Like, it didn't look like a first film to me. No, not at all. And she was also smart enough, which is the mark of a smart director, uh, to hire really good people around her. Uh, Julia mm -hmm. Prenda produced it. Kayla York produced it. They both have strong backgrounds in getting movies made and making sure they're good. And she brought in some other, you know, talented players on the in the other departments and, and that's that's smart. That's how you get the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah, exactly. And uh so look look for look for that guys on VOD. That should and like you said, that should be available everywhere. Um now going back to uh Supernatural, because that's obviously a very big thing that a very very big part of of uh, your weekend it seems. Um so obviously you still got a lot of people recognizing you from Supernatural. Is the are the conventions things that you still do like quite a bit, or is it just once in a blue moon? Or no, nah, we do a ton of them. Um, there's a core group of us that do uh, about eighteen to twenty a year, and wow. the, these are not mixed medium conventions. These are Supernatural only standalone three day events that are just about the show. The core group is Jared Jensen, Misha. Uh, Collins, Mark Shepard, Rob Benedict, Matt Cohen, and myself. We're kind of the, the, the core group that go from town to town, and we bring in other actors to fill in in each different city to make it, you know, interesting and unique. Um, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a really unique world. We have the, you know, most popular convention circuit since Star Trek in this show, and so there's a huge audience for it, and there's a huge uh, following town to town, and we are blessed with a super supportive audience that comes out and wants to see us talk and do our thing. So we we go and we do, and we do it all over the continental U.S., uh, Canada, and Europe. It's funny you mentioned William Shatner has yeah has he shown up to try to start stuff with uh, Misha Collins? <laughs> Shatner actually came to our show in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and introduced. Uh, Loud and Swain, which is the, the band that anchors a, a Saturday night show we have here. It's Rob Benedict's band. And okay. they put on a show Saturday night, and, and actors who are musically inclined as well come and join the band for a song or two. And Shatner uh, came to that and introduced the band. It was awesome because Star Trek was doing a, a convention down the street. And Misha <laughs> introduced Shatner. So Sh Misha came out and introduced Shatner. Shatner came out and introduced the band. It was great. <laughs> oh, it's all coming together. <laughs> Uh, so now, also, um, you had a run on the show, I believe you did five or six episodes? Five. That's it. Five? Okay. And that's incredible that you could still have that following after only five episodes. Like, that's... Yeah, you and, know, I, and... I, attribute, I attribute that a lot to the, you know, fans latch on to characters they like, and I was fortunate enough mm -hmm. to play a character that resonated with the fans. And I mean, in each of those episodes, you are kind of uh, a big central point of the plot, so that has a lot to do with it as well, I believe. 
For sure. I mean, I was given a great role. I was given a, a great opportunity to play dual characters on the show, and, and that's when you're just a guest star. That's really, really rare. Um, no, on any show. So that was a, a great gift, and I think that sort of helped the role stand out. So now, what was it like? Uh, I believe it's season eleven. Uh, you got to actually step behind the camera and direct an episode. That was awesome. That was a super cool opportunity um, that I got, and I just had a blast. I, I got given a great script by Jenny Klein. Um, I had the wonderful support of showrunner, then showrunner Jeremy Carver, uh, Bob Singer, Phil Segrisha, who all were, you know, incredibly supportive of a first-time TV director stepping behind the, the lens. It was a great experience. Yeah, and it was uh, is an episode about an imaginary friend that you directed? Correct. It's called Just My yeah. Imagination. Beautiful. And uh, so, okay, so another big one that I've noticed that, you, uh, that you've been a part of as well is uh, the miniseries uh, Band of Brothers. You play Scar- Sergeant Skip Muck. Is that another one that comes up quite a bit for you? Um. Yeah, that's you know that's one of those shows that um, I will never do anything I think that surpasses that experience. That was a a fantastic opportunity, but more than just a, a business opportunity, it was a fantastic personal experience. Getting to know the other actors, um, getting to pr- portray the real men who fought in the war, and just the way in which it was handled by. With Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg, and HBO, it just was a, a seminal event in my life, and and you know, translated to great television. But before it was great television, it was it was a great process for all of us. And you also worked with uh, Dale Dye on getting ready for that, didn't you? I did. Oh, oh yeah. So Dale put us through the works, man. He, uh, he I did uh, a boot camp with him. It was two weeks. All of us went through there. I think twelve days actually, but it was a an, <laughs> an amazing experience because none of us who were the core actors had ever been in the military. So it was as close as we will ever get to having that experience for real. And uh, Captain Dye and his team really, uh, it doesn't feel like you're playing pretend, man. You, it feels real. You're up all night. You're getting screened at. You're living a very difficult life for that period of time in order to prepare you for the task ahead. And it was, it was I mean, it's uh, irreplaceable in the process for getting an actor ready to play a soldier because playing a soldier, playing a, especially a real person, who did, did these amazing things. I mean, actors, if they've never been in the military, have a hard time imagining what that would be like, especially, you know, the wartime exploits over the World War II soldiers, many of whom had never been on an airplane until they had to go jump out of one. It was a different time. And mm-hmm. just trying to get in that mindset, you, you can't... You, you, having the team of Captain Guy and his cadre was invaluable in getting us ready to do that show. And I mean, I think that's something that comes across too. I've been watched uh, shows and movies uh, taking place during the war and the military. You can tell sometimes when they kind of haven't been through that, they're not showing that in their face, but uh, band of brothers, you could definitely tell throughout the whole series that it was, it was hard to, it was hard to just look at them as actors for, for the much of the series. That's great. You know, I mean, there's a lot of familiar faces when you go to that series now, but at the time, there was almost no familiar faces, and I think that also helped the series because you, yeah. you weren't ever pulled out of it by, oh, there's my star from my that star from my favorite show. You were watching it, going, oh, there's Captain Winters, and oh, there's yeah. you know Sergeant Luz. You weren't thinking about who was playing those roles because you didn't know. Yeah, it may may have been a bit distracting to have John Travolta show up. <laughs> Correct. Yes, for sure, <laughs> for everyone. Yeah. Um, so also, um, it, besides the acting too, I heard that you're, I've also heard that you're also musically inclined. A, a little bit, you know, I mean, I, look, I, it's a hobby for me. Uh, you know, I, okay. I'm fortunate to do the supernatural circuit with a bunch of guys who are real musicians. So I'm a bass player by hobby and I get to play with these guys. But, um, fortunately I didn't ever decide to be a musician for a living because it would have been a long and, uh, not financially... <laughs> Uh, beneficial road. So you never thought about uh, about like trying to rec- like record a co- like an album or anything like that? No, Lord, no. no? I play. I've been playing in ba- bands since I was fifteen, playing bass, and I love it. Um, yeah. I, I don't play now. I play with these guys, but I don't play in a band now. But I, I just love for me playing playing music is like playing pickup basketball with my buddies. To me, it's just pure fun. Um, I'm not a songwriter. I don't you know. I leave that to 
to those who have that gift. I'm, I'm a utilitarian player, and I love, I love that position, and I love playing, and, I, and I'm, I'm confident enough to play with guys who are really good without being really good myself. <laughs> Well, I've, I mean, I've seen some videos of you, guys, of you doing covers with a couple of the guys from the show, and uh, I'm just surprised that you never recorded anything. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's uh, <laughs> We are, like I said, we are, I'm sitting here actually right with Mark Shepard, who's sitting with me, and he and I are kind of the architects of what the Saturday night show is with the band, and we're blessed. He's a hell of a drummer. We're just blessed with these amazingly talented musical friends, so we're able to do this thing on Saturday night that's just unlike anything anybody's doing on any convention circuit, I can assure you. Okay, so the last thing I want to mention, I, I just, I, now I was just about to get everything uh, set up here until I noticed something come up on, uh, somebody messaged me about uh, some Pepsi commercial, and I was watching these Pepsi commercials, and then you did one with Snoop Dogg. Now, was this was this before the show, or some of them after the show? Uh, it was after, after, so like when I'm snapping and doing all that stuff with Snoop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it was after the show, and one of the ad execs for Pepsi at the time was a big Supernatural fan. Um, so I don't know if they were doing those uh, parallels on purpose or by coincidence, but there's definitely some similarities, I think, sometimes to what I was doing in the Pepsi spots to uh, what um, ended up, you know, what, what the trickster and uh, Gabriel had done in the show. Yeah, because I was, I was getting some very uh, trickster-like vibes from it, <laughs> so I wasn't sure if it was if it was uh, after or before. So it makes a lot of no, sense. No, it was after. after. It was after. Yeah. Very okay. funny. Um, all right. Well, do you have anything else that you're currently working on? You want to promote or anything like that? I do. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, I have a new series coming out in the fall, which is coming up right very soon, on a new digital uh, network called. Comic Con HQ, and it's a series, a single camera comedy created by Rob Benedict and myself, written by Rob Benedict and myself, starring Rob Benedict and myself, and directed by me. That's called Kings of Con, and it's a single camera comedy that takes the takes place behind the topsy turvy world of fan conventions, where the craziest people in the room are always the actors paid to be there. <laughs> awesome. And then, you, and you said that uh, that debuts when again? That debuts this fall, most likely in November. So. Coming up really soon, go to ComicConHQ.com for more details and to uh, download the app so you can have the network on your phone and on your devices. It's available on Roku, Amazon, and everywhere else you get those apps and uh, watch the show. Perfect. Well, hey, uh, like I said, like he said, you can check that out in, coming up in November. Uh, the Evil Gene is available on VOD pretty much across the board on any VOD platform you can find. Uh, I want to thank you very much, and thanks for putting up with the technology today, and uh, th thanks for your time. Absolutely. Thanks for the interview, man. I appreciate it very much.